Vamos a empezar. Eh, we'll be, we are about to begin. Um, for the Spanish English translation. Ok. Y para quien eh, no entienda eh, inglés, también tenemos... And for those of you who do, do not understand English, we have outside some uh, devices for you to be able to listen to the simultaneous interpretation from English into Spanish. So, uh, we like to welcome you to this talk about uh, unity and resistance heading towards a Palestinian transition. This is the fourth and last day of our Palestine week that we have been preparing um, here in, with lots of love here in uh, Casa Arabe. For those of you who have not been following the Palestine Week, on Monday we discussed uh, the cuisine, the Gaza cuisine, uh, which was uh, a very good exponent of uh, the Mediterranean cuisine. Then we had a concert uh, from uh, Haifa, uh, with uh, Haifa, she, pre 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 she uh, sang for us and showed us a, a musical proposal. Then we also discussed uh, independent music among uh, the Palestinian youth and how this is, in fact, a declaration of their own identity and how they are questioning through this cultural initiatives not only occupation but also patriarchy and other um, means of oppression within the Palestinian society. So the talk was extremely interesting and a concert was a pure delight. Yesterday we watched a documentary and then we had a discussion uh, condemned in Gaza. This is a documentary that you've probably heard about. It uh, deals with the issue of uh, women uh, with cancer in uh, the Gaza Strip and how uh, difficult, how challenging and even impossible it is for them to undergo treatment for the uh, sickness, for the disease. So, and today, today, well, it's the crowning, uh, the jewel of the crown uh, that we have, the icing on the cake. It's been a while since we had uh, tried to to have Ramsey Barut here in Casa Arabe. We tried earlier, but there was then the, the pandemic happened. He was about to to come here as a part of the university classroom program. And then, as we had, were planning this, we tried to hook him, to hook him and, and to fish him out of the water to, to see whether he was available. And yes, success he was. And uh, he was planning on coming to, to Spain. So, well, uh, it's a very fortunate uh, coincidence. It, it was written in the stars. So now we have Ramsey Baruch with us here today. So this discussion also is going to have uh, quite a, a political approach, uh, current events approach. He is a journalist, he's an editor of the Palestine Chronicle. I will be reviewing uh, his bio in a moment. But in Casa Arabe, since uh, last spring, we could not actually focus on the events in West Jerusalem these outbreaks of youth violence at uh, the door of Damascus, at the gate of Damascus, and then uh, the evictions of Palestinian rest in, residents in the Sheikh Sarah, uh neighborhood. Probably you saw this, you watched this on the international news. Uh, it was by the end of the Ramadan period. It was described as escalation of violence without giving uh, too much of a background. It was, it uh, spread to to Gaza, to uh, the uh, West Bank as well. And, uh, well, we thought, we have considered it was, it was uh, key for us to return, to go back to that moment in time and try to dissect it and understand it better. And that's a bit what we try to do here in Casa Arabe, trying to, to get uh, the complexity of the Arab world closer to the people living here in Spain. And uh, of course, we will be able to do that with the help of our analysts. So let me introduce you to Ramsey. And then, of course, I'd like to thank Ichaso Dominguez de Olazabal uh, for her presence here. Uh, that will be a very fruitful debate. He is a Palestinian uh, 
uh, American journalist and editor of the Palestine Chronicle. He has also been editor-in-chief of the Middle East Eye and deputy editor-in-chief of Al Jazeera Online. He is the author of uh, approximately 20 books, which include the Second Palestinian Intifada, Chronicle of the People's Struggle, The Last Earth, a Palestinian story, and these change will break in Palestinian stories of struggles and defiance in Israeli prisons. Barut holds a PhD in Palestine studies from the University of Exeter in the UK, and his work has been published in hundreds of newspapers and magazines around the world, including the Washington Post, the International Herald Tribune, the Miami Herald, Japan Times, Al Haram Weekly, and several others. So, uh, Itaso Dominguez de Olazabal, she is the coordinator of the uh, panel for um, the Foundation Alternativas. So, uh, we will be holding a uh, dialogue here, a conversation. Both Itaso and myself have prepared some questions, and the idea is to um, get you closer to the new Palestinian narratives, who are the main protagonists and what are the challenges they are facing and uh, their outlooks, what perspective they have for success. So I'm now going to give the floor to Itaso that uh, will begin with the questions for Ramsey. Well, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. We will be uh, asking the questions in English, if you don't mind. And if uh, there's uh, anyone who, who does not understand English, we don't believe that's the case, you can always listen to the translation. Uh, with us uh, this afternoon and every, everybody that is acquainted with uh, what's happening in historic Palestine now and, and for, for years now, uh, knows uh, Ramzi and, and has read uh, all that, uh, everything that Ramzi has written uh, throughout, the, throughout the years. And, and this set of questions uh, aim at having a, a, a picture of what's happening nowadays, and, but also what ha what's been happening for years. Uh, first of all, uh, and I think uh, we are not just celebrating today the, the, the day of solidarity with the Palestinian people, the Palestine Week, but uh, this year is also the 30th anniversary of the so-called Madrid Peace Conference that took place in 1991. And according to some, uh, for example, we, have, we also uh, were able to read, to read analysis in, for example, Ashabaka and other media, this is a moment to take stock and a moment to reflect. Uh, how would you characterize uh, the shift in the narrative that a growing segment of Palestinians is demanding nowadays and maybe has been demanding for, for years now? Right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Karim. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, talking to you and, and being in this uh, truly beautiful city of Madrid. Um, indeed, the, there is so much reflection to be done, but I think it's the kind of reflection that should inspire true action. Um, I feel like we are at the cusp of that moment, finally. We have been waiting for it for such a long time. We've been writing about it, um, theorizing about it, analyzing it, and uh, it's finally happening. <clears throat> and um, it's, quite, it's quite validating, in a sense, that's happening the way it's happening now, because the argument that we have been making for such a long time, that it will ultimately be the Palestinian people themselves who are going to determine the nature and the timing and the style of resistance that they are going to use. Uh, all of this true, true nonsense, really, that has been happening uh, since Oslo. And I wouldn't say since Madrid. That's a different analysis, and, and, and we can discuss this in a minute. That's been happening since Oslo until today. It's a complete avoidance of talking about the real issues that matters to the Palestinian people. Um, everything that has happened since then, if anything, it has indeed secured and, 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 and rooted the Israeli occupation, contributed to the rise of Israeli colonialism through the expansion of illegal settlements, uh, and has relegated the most fundamental and basic rights of the Palestinian people uh, to the absolute margins. The right of return for Palestinian refugees, for example. We haven't been talking about this for years. Palestinian refugees, not just in Palestine itself, but also in Lebanon, in Syria, in Syria that's a whole different discussion and a whole different story, in Iraq, 
in Egypt and all over the world, they have been removed by that, from that discussion because Oslo told us that this is one of the complex issues. Like, for example, the status of Jerusalem. That has to be left to the so-called final status negotiations, which never really happened. And in my mind, I don't think they were ever intended to happen in the first place. So Palestinians have been kind of waiting in their refugee camps that are just falling apart. And anyone who has been to South Lebanon, visited the Ain al-Hilwa, for example, would, would understand what that means. There's this sense of waiting. I mean, I grew up in a refugee camp in Gaza myself. My family come from a village uh, in today's Israel, historic Palestine, that has, was destroyed by, by Israel uh, over 70 years ago. And I know what waiting is. Literally, you have the, il the elders of our community, you know, with this habit of taking blankets and, and putting it in front of their doors and just sitting and, and waiting. Uh, my grandfather, who was displaced from his village in, in Palestine, uh, when his life was just beginning to take off, when, when his fortunes in life were beginning to change in his favor, and then suddenly Zionism, colonialism finally prevail, and the residents of this small village, along with 500 other villages, are ethnically cleansed, being pushed to new spaces in which they were not at all familiar, having to build new lives in refugee camps with so very little, and the world looking the other way, and the Arabs, um, despite of all their fiery speeches and their, their pledges and commitments to the uh, liberation of Palestine, ultimately did very little, and now they are normalizing. My grandfather used to sit with one uh, leg over the other and just had this look in and constantly waiting for literally decades. Um, and then he died and, and he was buried in the, in the refugee camp's graveyard where thousands upon thousands of refugees also went through the process of waiting, waiting for the international community to do something, waiting for the Arabs to come. We used to have this, this uh, rumor that we used to circulate back in Gaza in the refugee camps, that, that such and such country or such and such army are coming to the rescue. I wrote about it in my previous books and, and articles. And because it tells us something, uh, at one point we were told that the Algerian army was coming. Um, and at one point we were told that the Egyptian army was coming. And at one point we were told that the Iranians were coming. Um, and and I, blame, I blame this rumor on taxi drivers. They are terrible because, because Gaza is a very small place and these poor guys are, are like hamsters on a wheel. <laughs> so they circulated these terrible rumors and, and the thing is, in fact I wrote about this in the foreword to my upcoming book with Ilan Pape about the rumor and what it actually represents, the fact that we have been waiting for a liberator, an outside liberator, any liberator. And, and you know, and ultimately, and my father, my father was a communist, uh, and, and he would be sitting with his communist friends talking about communist things. Um, and, and, and they would always say, don't believe these rumors, nobody will ever come to our rescue, it will be us who will liberate ourselves. And in fact, this is very much consistent with a famous statement by Che Guevara, where he says, there are no such thing as liberators. Uh, the people liberate themselves. Um, but I also noticed that despite the fact that they used to say these things, ultimately, they used to always hope in the back of their minds that maybe actually someone is coming. And, and, so, and, then, and then when it's discovered nobody is coming, they would say, well, we knew it all along anyway, but they did it. Um, why is that important? Because I think what happened in May was another reminder that is ultimately the Palestinian people, not Oslo. Not even Madrid, with all due respect. Uh, uh, not the Arabs, for sure not the Arabs. And not the United Nations, and not the, you know, um, the, those who speak of a human rights democracy and Geneva Conventions. And it is the Palestinian people who will assert their centrality to the Palestinian narrative, their centrality to the Palestinian discourse. It's not Israel, 
is not Israeli leaders, is not corrupt Palestinian leaders who are going to tell us what is to be discussed now and what is to be left to the final status negotiations. Our rights cannot be divided, cannot be segmented. And, and that's the new voice of Palestine that you hear everywhere now. And it's really incredible. Back in the day, it used to be a Palestinian from, you know, Palestine 48, today's Israel, would speak in a political discourse that seemed alien to me growing up in Gaza. It, it, it seemed alien to someone living in the West Bank and so forth. And as of late, with the division, political division of Palestinian factions, where Gaza is Hamas, West Bank is Fatah, and even the West Bank divided and segmented itself, area A, area B, area C, well, I mean, these realities create socio-economic realities. And people start be, you know, if you live in a certain area, you are more likely to be richer or poorer than if you live in other areas because of the kind of access you have. So we started even in, since Oslo seeing further segmentation and fragmentation of the Palestinian socio-economic reality. And Palestinian classes became very accentuated. And then suddenly, poof, it's all gone. I speak to a Palestinian intellectual from Palestine 48, we are using the same terminology, the same language, the same discourse, the same narrative. And that applies to all Palestinians in all political spaces. What does this tell us? That ultimately, yes, it is the Palestinian people who will assert their importance and significance in this conflict. And it's ultimately, it will be us who will decide the timing and the direction and the nature of our resistance as well. Thanks so much. That was so powerful already. And speaking of powerful, last Monday, Mohammed al Qurd, I'm sure you've all heard of him, <laughs> a Palestinian writer and poet from Sheikh Jarrah. So, no, no, oh, sorry. He delivered a powerful speech at the UN, at the United Nations. Uh, he didn't mince his words in stating his view of the body and of the international community as a whole. I, I recommend you watch the videos <laughs> as soon as you, as you get home. And what has been the role of the international community towards the situation in Palestine throughout the last years? You already spoke a little bit about that, but maybe it will be interesting to... Well, I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with political language and how language can actually be be used and manipulated to create certain realities that might be true or might not be true. For example, when you say the peace process, it has nothing to do to, of peace and there's no process. Uh, when you say uh, a moderate Palestinian, what does that mean? And a radical Palestinian, extremist Palestinian, what does that mean? Who decides this? I mean, everything is objective. Everything is from someone else's point of view. So when the Americans decide that I am a radical, they are taking a political position and juxtaposing my position to declare the American foreign policy. So a good Palestinian from Washington's point of view is a bad Palestinian from my point of view. So everything is relative um, in, in that sense. So when we say international community, well, there is international community as international law, but nobody is respecting that. Nobody is implementing that. We Palestinians have files and files and files of United Nations resolutions and of uh, General Assembly resolutions, of, of Security Council resolutions, of numerous other overlappings with international law, of the Fort Geneva Conventions and, 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 and such, and, and, and the Hague regulations. And, and we constantly make this very impressive legal case that never lead to anything. Ultimately, because there is another international community. And that other international community follows, you know, what we used to call back in the day the Washington Census. So these are the people who are revolving around the diktats of Washington. And diktats of Washington have been following the diktats of Israel. It's always been that way. And that international, so we have these contradictions. And you see these contradictions all the time. Uh, the fact that the United Nations comes and uh, insists on the Palestinian people rights to this and that, sovereignty, two states, uh, justice, equalities, etc. But when it comes to implementation, everybody just stares at everybody else and nothing is happening. Um, and, and you see this in the European Union, for example. Now they want to label products that are coming from Israeli settlements. Well, if you know that it's illegal settlements, and you know that this is based on the exploitation of Palestinian resources, 
Why even allow the products here in the first place? You want to block the, the, the you, you insist on following the, the, the wisdom of international law regarding Palestine, but at the same time, you are the biggest trade partner of Israel as far as the Israeli economy. If it's not for the United, for the European Union, the Israeli economy would, would shrink by a massive percentage. So these are the contradictions. And, and I, I think as, as, a, as a Palestinian who is a student of history, I'm not saying we should abandon the international community or, 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 or turn our backs to uh, appealing to international law, but we should not exaggerate this, the centrality of the, this international com community in our struggle. In the history of any national liberation movement, uh, anywhere in the world, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, the freedom and sovereignty was only established not by the laws that w and regulations that were created by the very colonial regimes that imposed colonialism, but despite of them, it is the people whom themselves that managed to actually push for that moment. So, um, if you leave it to the international community, the most we Palestinians can hope for is a little bit more aid, some sugar, some flour, but it ends at that. And, and that cannot be a program for liberation um, anywhere. Not, not acceptable for Palestinians, it's not acceptable for anyone else. Uh, thanks so much. So, uh, as you know, elections that were theoretically aimed at renewing the Palestinian institutions were scheduled for May 2021, but have been suspended and nobody knows when they are going to happen or if they are actually going to happen. Could you describe the current context of the Palestinian political arena? Um, so you're referring to the May events um, and, and, and that particular moment. Uh, so I'm referring to what's nowadays happening when it comes to Palestinian political institutions and elites and mainly when right. why, did it, why did, were elections supposed to happen and why, why right. didn't they happen and what are the demands of Palestinians towards right. that situation? To, to begin with, I think even though Palestinians want elections, as far as, as the, the future of the Palestinian people and future of Palestinian resistance and, and struggle, I think they are irrelevant. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's very strange that we are even putting uh, uh, emphasis on a subject of elections in an occupied country <laughs> where people, I mean, how can you, from a rational point of view, conduct fair democratic elections under the boots of Israeli soldiers? How can you do that? when third of the Palestinian parliament at one point of the previous elections were in prison. How can you do that? When Palestinian leaders elected or not elected can be assassinated at any point, not just in Palestine itself, but in Dubai or in Malaysia or in Cyprus or somewhere else. How can you do that? So I, I think this is kind of a conversation that is perhaps aimed at buying time for the Palestinian Authority, creating political validation. Mahmoud Abbas is the kind of like the wheeler and dealer of Palestinian lives and politics and everything. When in, in actuality, if it's not for, the, for, the, for Israel, Mahmoud Abbas wouldn't exist for not even a day, a matter of hours. So this is the reality of it. So I feel like the emphasis on the elections was, was really never done in a sincere way. Uh, and Palestinians don't, do not only live in Gaza and the West Bank, but Palestinians live in the Shatat, in the diaspora. There are millions of us. Um, are we voting? Are we part? Of, and what are we voting on? Are, are we voting on um, whether you know, electricity should become made more available? But who controls Palestinian electricity? Who controls Palestinian water resources? So, so that the contradictions of the whole issue of elections is puzzling and, and very strange. I think the real elections happened in May. I think the elections happened in May. And I think those who won the elections, you mentioned Muhammad al-Kurd, but I also mentioned Mun al-Kurd, which is really has been quite iconic in the Palestinian struggle. But, but there are only one or two out of hundreds of people that you do not know of, you haven't heard their names, maybe they're not even on social media, and you might never hear their names, but in actuality, this kind of mobilization would have, would have never happened without them. 
They are the real heroes of, of, of this new generation, and they are the people who have been voted in by the consensus of the street. Uh, now, I, I immediately, when the events happened in May, I started speaking of a Palestinian revolution. And I, 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 do not, I do not use uh, language lightly. History has taught us to be very careful with the selection of language. For example, when everybody was you know, praising the Arab Spring, I was referring to the so-called Arab Spring and warning, in, in fact, for men, you know, if, if you look at the etymology of the name itself, it was actually uh, coined by a neoconservative in the American administration uh, during the first Iraq elections when the U.S. invaded Iraq. So I was like, don't get too excited, be careful what language is being used and what language is being promoted. Yet despite of this, I spoke of a Palestinian revolution and I was told several times, Ramsey is a little bit too hasty, it's like, it is a revolution. It doesn't matter if that revolution happens uh, over the course of years or happens over the course of days. What really matters is that what is the moment what is that exact moment in history that has been created by this particular event? And this is what happened. Uh, number one is that the, the sense of unity among Palestinians. Uh, a friend of mine, Professor Ilan Papi, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with his work. Uh, and and we, we did a book together that should appear in about two weeks called Our Vision for Liberation. Um, and we spoke with numerous Palestinian intellectuals from everywhere. And, 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 and we were a bit worried that we want them to contribute their own vision for a Palestinian future. Each one in his own field, the artist in how to use art as a form of liberation. The, 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 the uh, doctor, how to use medicine to empower society. Um, the politician, the diplomat, how can politics and diplomacy be used not as a way to um, achieve personal compromises, but how you can actually, uh, you know, negotiate or, or, or facilitate through politics and diplomacy the best deal possible for the Palestinian people. And we spoke with all kinds of activists, but one thing we were worried about is it was a new experiment. Is this going to appear to be 30 different disconnected essays in a single book? Or is there a common narrative? And what is that common narrative? And it was incredible. I mean, because the, the essays were being written after the May events. And the outcome was, there is a common narrative. There is a common frame of reference. There is a common language. Ilan told me that when he went to Haifa, and he spoke with the Arab youth, Palestinian youth in Haifa, and he asked them, are you with Hamas or with Fatah, sarcastically? And they said, no, 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 no more of this language whatsoever. We are all Palestinians. The same sentiment was echoed from Sheikh Jarrah to Nablus to Gaza and even beyond that to also the Palestinian refugee camps throughout the Middle East. And, and, and this is, this is uh, I think, in, in, uh, a very central moment in the history of Palestine because we are beginning to see a shift. Whether Mahmoud Abbas conducts an election, doesn't conduct an election, it really doesn't matter. And you know what? I will go even further. And I will say whether Hamas or Fatah found some sort of a deal in, in which they agreed to distribute responsibilities, or it also doesn't matter. What really matters, and that is that there is a new generation, a new Palestinian generation that has learned from the past, doesn't use the references of the past, and is looking forward with new energy. Now, the question is, now here we are, we are transitioning, there are no guarantees. Despite of all of this, there are no guarantees. There is hope, there is promise, but we do not know what will happen because there are so many new variables. And now it's the responsibility of this new generation to understand the nature of their challenges and to develop their strategy according to these various var var uh, variables that exist right now.
Thanks so much. Uh, actually, uh, as, you, uh, as you said, uh, you spoke about the revolution and, and some or many Palestinians, uh, especially this, this, uh, y this new generation. And actually, one of the questions was about the new generation. I was going to mention also Mona Al-Kord, also Yara Hawari, Salem Barahme, uh, Amjad Irak, Tarek Bakoni, but also many unknown people that, that were willing to take to the streets and also take to their computers from the diaspora. And, uh, the, name, the name was Unity Intifada or Intifada of Unity. Could you expand a bit on that? We talk about the disunity, Palestinian disunity, uh, quite often, but, but the, the, the factional disunity doesn't worry me. It's the nature of faction. In fact, the term faction itself is factional. The term faction itself reeks of division. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's the, the, the disunity of the Palestinian people, perhaps of circumstances out of our control. I mean, let me, let me draw you a picture. If you are a Palestinian living in Gaza, what's your top priority, perhaps prior to May? You want the end of the siege. You want to be able to get out of Gaza, to go to a hospital in Jerusalem, to Al Maqasid, for example or to reach an Egyptian hospital or an Egyptian university, or to use Egypt as a stopover before you go to your other place of business or work. It was the siege. Um, with time, the, the discussion about Gaza became a discussion purely about the siege. And as a result, there was a new discourse, or new narrative rather, that entered the vocabulary regarding Gaza, and these are all humanitarian issues. Now, this is very dangerous because, yes, there is a terrible humanitarian situation that is happening in Gaza, but, but, but emphasizing that aspect alone takes a, away from the political nature of the, of, of the problem. Uh, Gaza is not under siege because of a hurricane or a natural disaster or an earthquake. Gaza is under siege because the Palestinian people voted uh, in, in 2006 a decision that did not fit the expectations and the strategies of Israel, and they were punished as a result. But even prior to that, Israel has been under siege, called the Israeli occupation. Right? So removing the element of politics and focusing on the humanitarian element, number one, it dehumanizes Palestinians. It makes them look like they are charity cases or just seeking you know, mere survival. And they are not political agents. Uh, now, if you are a Palestinian living in Area C, you can't build because 60% of the West Bank, which is Area C, is located under Israeli occupation. Um, you can't build. You cannot, uh, um, um, you cannot travel. You are stuck in this no-go no you know, uh, land and, and you are not able to live a normal life. You are envying people who are slightly, who are living under Area B because they have slightly better status than you are. Who and everybody is envying those who are living in Area A because you are an autonomous Palestinian, although you are still under Israeli occupation and you can't go or come back without the, uh, a, a permit or a permission from the Israeli military. And of course, they are all looking at Palestinians in East Jerusalem with great envy. They are not citizens. They, their status is still very much compromised, but they are residents. And that kind of allows them a little bit more space, a bit more opportunities to work, but not all kinds of jobs. They can travel, but maybe not as often, and so forth. And perhaps the most envious of them all are the Palestinian citizen of Israel. Yes, he's treated as a fourth-class citizen. Yes, his language is relegated. Yes, his culture is, is uh, under constant attack, even their history cannot be taught in their own schools, yet somehow they are still the most privileged of them all, and so forth. Now, we can't pretend that you can live under these geographic and geopolitical realities and, and, and still see yourself as one, uh, 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 one in a larger whole, that we are all somehow part of the same collective. This is something that I have written a lot about and I have dedicated really most of my books to the issue of, of, of Palestinian people's history. And I've done that on purpose, out of fear that perhaps the Palestinian, like my children living in Seattle, 
Yes, they go to protest and they carry flags and they wear the kufiya proudly and they study Arabic at universities. And, um, but they have never been to Gaza. And I worry, are they truly at the same level of consciousness? Um, and are they really truly see themselves as one of that whole in Gaza? And, and that's the beauty of what is happening right now. That yes, we, we were disunited, again, by circumstances out of our control, but now, once again, we are finding that unity. And we are now kind of almost kind of learning the alphabets of Palestinian unity once more. Just a quick uh, example, one of the contributors to the book is the head of the Palestinian uh, community in Chile, Anwar Malouf. And, and um, as you know, the Palestinian community in Chile is, is one of the largest uh, in, outside the Middle East. I think about 500,000 Palestinians. And, and, and uh, you were talking, Karim, earlier about the, uh, a gentleman of uh, mixed names, you know. Uh, so you will have Jose Muhammad or something of that nature. And yet somehow, um, they, they have a football club, very popular, the Deportivo Palestino. Uh, and uh, and they, there was a huge fight between them and FIFA because they insisted on wearing the full map of Palestine, historic Palestine, on their jerseys. And FIFA um, had them pay a fine for that. And, and, and who paid the fine? Donations came pouring in from all over the world. And, and for many of us, we kind of discovered that we have sisters and brothers in that part of the world. And through that connection, we began connecting with our sisters and brothers in Bolivia and Venezuela. And suddenly, there's a whole new Palestinian reality happening in South America. And when you read what Anwar Malouf has written, despite the fact that he is a third generation Palestinian, uh, his grandparents um, had escaped during the Ottoman era. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and yet, you, he, he speaks Arabic very poorly. Um, he writes in Spanish. We translated his essay to English. But, but this kind of passion, this kind of, of belonging and identity can only happen if, if, if it's communicated by a true Palestinian. And this is really, this is what's happening all over the world. I'm not trying to add sentiment. I mean, I'm not trying to sentimentalize the issue. Uh, it is true that everything that Israel has done to segment us physically, fragment us politically, despite all of this, here we are. We're still talking about Palestine. We are still, you are here to hear me talk about Palestine. Why are you here? Why does this matter? Who made that possible? It's certainly not the Palestinian leadership. Certainly not the Palestinian factions, certainly not the international community, and definitely not the Arabs. It's the Palestinians themselves. 70 plus years since the Nakba, the original destruction of the Palestinian homeland, uh, nearly 55 years since the Nexa, the, 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 the war and the occupation of the remainder of Palestine in 1967, we are still talking about Palestine. When the May events took place, even COVID-19, news related to COVID and the pandemic, had to take a back seat. Palestine was in the news, despite of everything. There is something about the Palestinian people that allows them to constantly reassert themselves as, as, a, as a cause that is very important. They assert themselves on the consciousness of the humanity, and somehow, every single time they renew that kind of energy and they renew and they build massive solidarity all over the world. And it's, it, it is because of the Palestinian people themselves and no, no um, other factor. Thanks so much. I think Karim has. Yes, uh, thank you, Chasson Ramzi. Uh, just a quick reminder that you may also um, take note of questions uh, on your mind or on a piece of paper and we will pass on the microphone uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so of, uh, of, this, of this talk. And the same goes for everyone who's following us on, on our YouTube channel or channels today because we're also uh, streaming this in both uh, English and in the, in the Spanish uh, translation. So, um, uh, Ramzi, you mentioned um, I mean, you have explained this 
uh, amazing moment that the, uh, the, the Palestinians are living and are somehow building. Uh, and it seems that you are portraying a moment where a new alphabet is being uh, um, invented of, of sorts. And you're asking them not to go, um, or not asking them, but you have commented that going to uh, elections kind of makes no sense uh, because of the circumstances in which these elections would take place. But what, how exactly do you then, um, I mean, do, do you expect uh, just a natural movement of, uh, that, that spills a leader like Mohammed al-Kurd or his sister? Or, I mean, where does legitimacy, how does it build itself in such a fluid or liquid situation where you have all these communities that are somehow virtual, although of course they are real, but they gather in somehow a virtual space. So where, how do you organize institutionally, or maybe it's not institutionally that you're imagining the new, the new uh, transition to? Towards. That, that's an excellent question, Karim, and I think perhaps the best, best answer to that is to look at what happened during the first Intifada uh, in 1987. I, was, I lived the entirety of the Intifada in, in Gaza um, at the time, and I can tell you, uh, when the Intifada started, when the uprising started, um, and you know, there's this big conflict, whether was it in Jabalia refugee camp or it was in Nusayrat, my refugee camp. So people in Nusayrat say, we started the Intifada. People in Jabalia say, that's a different discussion. But the fact is, um, when it started, there was no such thing as, um, there was no s s you know, search for, for, for a, a leadership. It, 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 it somehow it manifested itself organically. The street itself, you know, made it very clear who is leading everyone. And, it's, um, and, 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 and within, within the matter of weeks, you had the formation of Al-Qiyada Al-Wataniyya Al-Muhada, the, the united leadership of the Intifada, which uh, it was kind of grassroots organizations happening uh, separately first in the West Bank, then in Gaza, then they emerged. And then, and then somehow, and, and none of this was done in advance. There was no academic research or anybody presenting a paper at a conference. As we see right now, everybody is talking about a Palestinian strategy as if it's the University of Chicago or, or Cambridge or whomever is going to be able to actually come up with the strategy, not the people on the streets themselves. But the first intifada allowed for the emergence of organic, and real leadership, and we didn't question that leadership because it, it seemed that it, it was, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't the leadership that created the language and the people and, and the revolution, it was the people and the language and revolution that yielded that leadership. So this is why I, I'm quite hesitant, at least at this stage, to speak of any representatives of the Palestinian people. And I think we have to be quite careful with that because that mistake has happened in the past and, and we have seen these leaderships um, kind of betray the Palestinians. So let that process transpire on its own. Let that revolution wither in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense of people taking to the streets or slow revolution that is happening in various aspects of Palestinian society, let it emerge, let it uh, uh, reach that, uh, that zenth, zenth of a moment that would allow that leadership to emerge on its own. For the time being, all I can say is that we have a collective national con consciousness that is emerging in Palestine at the moment. And there are many forces that are trying to stop it. Of course, Israel, because this means trouble. This means that, that the Palestinian people are now working together and coordinating. And, and, and let's not forget, Israel is in trouble. For many, many years, Israel has tried to create this illusion that, that this is not a military occupation. Israel is not an occupying power. This is not an apartheid. It's a completely different thing. This is why they keep jumping from, um, from one political discourse to another. 
uh, the latest being that this is part of Israel's war on terror that is similar to the American. They always kind of do these jingoisms, trying to play around with concepts to convince the world that the reality in Palestine is not a reality of colonialism, military occupation and apartheid is something else entirely. And Israel is now losing that fight. Now the term apart apartheid Israel trends constantly on Twitter. I, I doubt that there has been a single second, maybe in the last two, three years, in which that hashtag was not trending. Associating Israel with apartheid, which is a nightmare for Israel, apartheid regimes cannot be sustained. And having that brand in itself is, is a PR disaster, disaster and more than a PR disaster. But also the Palestinian Authority is keen on stopping this. Because if the Palestinians start speaking for themselves, separate from the Palestinian Authority, it means, it means that the legitimacy that the Palestinian Authority, and I, you know, airport legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority throughout the years vanishes. It doesn't exist. We are not, uh, you, Palestinian Authority existed as a transition to take us to the final status negotiations, which, which was supposed to finish in 1999. And after that, we're going to have a state, and some of the refugees symbolically will come back, and that's the end of the so-called conflict. None of this happened. The Palestinian Authority right now exists to protect the interests of Palestinian elites. A lot of money has been poured to Palestine, not to the poor Palestinian refugees, has been poured through to the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah that has become very wealthy. Uh, if you go to Ramallah and you would see the kind of lifestyle that they live, the fancy villas, the, you know, they are, not in, they are in no hurry to end the military occupation. Why should they? If something is serving you and your class very well, why do you want to bring it into it? So actually the Palestinian Authority is an obstacle in the way of Palestinian freedom. Now what's happening is the Palestinians are kind of as a people turning their back entirely to the Palestinian Authority. And they are organizing, mobilizing, having conversations, thinking without even paying any heed to them. And that must be very, very frustrating. I mean, you must remember that when, when the May events happened, the Palestinian Authority's political discourse began shifting. Suddenly Mahmoud Abbas was making references as if he was Fidel Castro leading a revolution. Uh, he was talking of martyrs, he was talking of resistance, he was talking of you know, all sorts of things that, uh, just to make himself relevant. That me and Mun al Kurd are friends, you know, everything is okay. You know, but of course nobody was buying that at all. And, and, and everyone has passed him. It really is the matter of time. Uh, now, whether the Palestinian Authority disintegrate as a, at a structural and institutional level, or it doesn't, it actually doesn't matter. Because we are forming something else entirely separate from the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going just to insist in the how, you know, <coughs> in how do we, what are the mechanisms, and you have, you have mentioned the, the, um, the huge challenges, and I think it's, <coughs> excuse me, no secret to anyone how unbalanced this, the, 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 uh, the balance of power is, how shifted, how clearly it is, you know, against civil society in the region and you know you have mentioned the Arab non-springs or you know the uprisings and we have seen how one after the other they have faced you know the counter-revolution and lost it they some people say because they had no leaders because they had not an organized structure and they were very easy to penetrate let us not forget the the, the very you know uh, widely uh, publicized Pegasus um, uh, um, software that has, you know, um, destroyed many uh, an initiative of uh, questioning power. So again, uh, I think there's there's all this uh, unity, uh, will of to unite and to uh, shift the the paradigm and, and change things. But what are the means for 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 all these 
different movements. As you said, there is Gaza, there is the West Bank, there is the diaspora, there is you know, the Palestinians of 1948, which we had uh, this, this very young musician two days ago talking about this and saying how also they, are not, they don't feel represented by their parties in the Knesset. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you do this? How do you, do you leave the, 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 the path that you're supposed to, to, uh, to thread? Right. Um, and I promise, I'm not running away from your question. It's a very good question. The problem is there's no ideal answer. Because as I said earlier, there are so many variables at work. And don't forget, we are not living in the age of liberation movements as happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and maybe up to the mid 80s. We're living in the age of post-Soviet Union, post, uh, you know, the rise of capitalism, rise of American hegemony, uh, and, and, and the disintegration of the Arab front. Arguably, there was an Arab front at one point, but it's falling apart. Um, so th these are numerous obstacles that are facing the Palestinian people. Now, the ideal answer is that there's no ideal answer, in the sense that we are in the very first steps, but going the right direction. Prior to that, it seems that we were having the wrong conversation. I mean, we started talking about the elections. It felt like that was the wrong conversation. Uh, talking about the peace process and the negotiations tables and the painful compromises and the good versus the bad Palestinians, that was the wrong conversation. Uh, now we are having the right conversation. It's like, it's like someone who is running, thinking that he's going the right direction and he discovers midway that I'm going the wrong direction. So he comes back and starting all over again. And I feel like in, in a sense we are starting all over again. That's the good news. We are going the right direction, but we are taking the very early steps. I was just recently with Mohammed al kurd speaking in New York um, about this very issue. And I was interested in what Mohammed had to say in terms of, you know, people in Gaza say, maybe we do not factor in, in the new language created by what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah. We need to be, it, it's, it's like, as if, as if there is this debate that's happening that we're not aware of on social media, via all sorts of uh, communication mechanisms in which young activists are talking with each other, trying to develop a language that is common to all of them. So this is very, very early in the process. Uh, now, what would be ideal from my point of view is, is, is for this language to evolve into an actual political discourse. And political discourse that is a tr truly representative of the Palestinian people. Mahmoud Abbas claims to be elected, for example, but we Palestinians say he doesn't represent us. Uh, if you look at any opinion poll, uh, Mahmoud Abbas is the majority of Palestinians want him out, but he stays and he says he represents us. But when Mun al-Kurd became a leader of a young generation, nobody said to Mun al-Kurd, you do not represent us. Because it was that authentic movement that was evolving on the ground. She didn't have to make election promises. She was herself a yield of an existing movement. Uh, movement. This is why there, nobody is questioning these young people, because we created these young people. It's our people who created them. So they represent us in that sense. And that would, what would be ideal, is, is creating a political discourse and I think that is being formulated at the moment. Uh, and, and second thing is finding the kind of leadership that, it's, that is, as we discussed, that organic leadership that emerges from the Palestinians themselves who are able, and this is very, very important, who are able to harness the energies and, 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 and to turn this political discourse that is validated by Palestinian communities all over Palestine, Middle East, and all over the world, and to turn it into an actual political strategy. And I am optimistic for several reasons. Number one, we have seen that how Palestinians managed to do this under the harshest of circumstances. During the pandemic, poverty, inequality, several layers of Israeli military occupation, Palestinian policing, 
Uh, even social media has, you know, Facebook, I mean, that in itself is just a war against, uh, against Facebook, the preventing the Palestinian voice from reaching the world. Yet we managed to break all these barriers and emerge as, as one unified people. So I'm optimistic because of that, but I'm also optimistic because of BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. Uh, this movement emerged from civil society in, in, uh, in Palestine itself, and slowly, despite all the obstacles, managed to actually assert itself as a platform of solidarity worldwide. Um, I, I live in Seattle, Washington. Sadly, uh, my state is one out of, I think, about 25 states now that have issued uh, laws against BDS, criminalizing the BDS movement and criminalizing the support uh, uh, of, of any form of boycott of Israel to the point that some communities in, in the southern uh, United States who know nothing about Palestine and Israel can't even locate Palestine on a map. Whenever there is a natural disaster in some of these places and the government offers to compensate people to help them, give them tents, shelter, food, they would actually have to sign a document Part of that document states that I in no way support the boycott of Israel. And it's ridiculous because so many of these people, I mean imagine a hurricane came and completely uprooted your house and someone comes and gives you a document and says you need to assert that you do not support BDS. Now some people say, well, you know, this is ridiculous. But there is something positive about this. That Israel is now fighting its war of legitimacy within American streets and towns and cities and neighborhoods. We have taken the fight over that. BDS has managed, and when I say BDS, I'm not talking about the, the structure of the movement itself. I'm talking about the power of civil society in hundreds, if not thousands of communities all over the world that actually managed to turn solidarity into a practical and tangible mechanism. And now we are pushing these agendas uh, in, in, in parliaments, we are pushing them at universities all over, uh, uh, all over the world, at civil society levels, at churches, mosques, synagogues, and so forth. Because we have done this, and as the, the result of this, we, you have this incredible cadre of Palestinian intellectuals all over the world who speak uh, very convincing, articulate language and can represent themselves and their people uh, like no one else. And, and, and it is now that layer of Palestinian intellectuals who are speaking to the rest of the world. We don't have to go through the archaic leadership. We don't have to resort to old terminologies and old narrative. We have that power of a young generation. Um, and I consider myself, because I'm still under 50, <laughs> to be part of that young generation. <laughs> but but it is truly, it's truly uplifting when you see all of this happening. And I, I know, I know, and, and I, I try to stop and correct myself um, regarding this particular point. Certain things are easy said than done. Uh, when you are a Palestinian living in Gaza, lacking everything. If you are a, a cancer patient who cannot get to a hospital, uh, if you are a, a farmer who cannot get to, to his farm, or a parents cannot get their children to school, and having to deal with the daily murders committed by the Israeli army, uh, I don't think they can, in the same breath, talk about hope and, and promise and, and, and have an optimistic view of the future. Uh, sometimes, yeah, we have to keep in mind our positionalities, where we are in the world and from what position we speak. That none with withstanding, there is a shift that's happening within the Palestinian movement, within the Palestinian narrative, and it's imposing itself as a new reality uh, all over the world. We have time for, um, for, an, a, for last, question. a last question. Uh, you've answered all of, all of the questions without us having to ask them. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, because we, we were going to ask about solidarity, fragmentation, about the new generation, which is the one, uh, again, it's, it's not, sometimes it's not quantitative, it's about the discourse of this new generation. This is why you said, you said I, I belong to this new generation, because this generation conveys a new narrative. And so, and, and so, but my last question, because you've written a book and your last book was about the book before, before the book that is forthcoming with Iran Pape, is about Palestinian prisoners. 
And uh, also, months ago, we were, Palestinians were inspired, and uh, I think part of the world we were, were inspired by what happened, right, by, by this great escape, right? And, and it is a collective uh, of Palis uh, also a segment of the Palestinian people that media do not usually speak about, but it's also representative of, of the structural violence the Palestinian people is subjected to systematically. Could you expand a bit on that? Because I, I, I'm sure in Spain nobody knows about Palestinian prisoners, and nobody knows. But now we have a Spanish prisoner that is in, in an Israeli prison. But. Especially the prisoners. I think, I think the... the, the um, it's as if there is a conspiracy not to talk about the prisoners. And I think the reason for a long time until, because of their sacrifices and because of their hunger strikes and because of the great escape that you mentioned, um, they managed to finally impose themselves uh, on, on the rest and the overall Palestinian narrative. Now, for the Palestinian people themselves, this is never an issue. The Palestinian prisoner is... is um, the, 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 the leader of, 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 of Palestinian society in various capacities. I grew up uh, in an environment in which you would go to a bookstore and there's always a section called Adab al Muqawama, the, uh, uh, and uh, Afwan Adab al Sujun, uh, the literature of prisons. Uh, it, uh, their finest novelists and poets and artists. So it's embedded in us, it's in our DNA uh, um, that the Palestinian prisoner is, is um, the true face of Palestinian resistance. Um, to the extent that uh, uh, sometimes, like let's say that someone wants to marry from another family, and, and you would say, well, are they a good family or a bad family? You say, well, they had a martyr and they had a prisoner. I mean, that in itself is a validation of the nobility. Of, uh, so that's at the socioeconomic discourse even, the, the, the prisoner plays an important role in Palestinian culture. Their pictures are all over the refugee camps. Everybody knows who they are and so forth. And of course, their family is elevated. The mother of the prisoner is, is beloved by the entire community. But outside Palestine, it seems that we have, and that's what I say, I feel like there's some kind of a conspiracy here, is that we did not want to talk about Palestinian prisoners. Because, well, number one, we are trying to humanize the Palestinian. By the way, I, th I think the term trying to humanize Palestinian, Palestinians is in some way dehumanizing. <laughs> because as if we are accepting in some strange sense that they were really not humans or not perceived to be as such. And, and we have to go through the process of, of whitewashing the Palestinian and making him human again. Um, but how do you humanize the Palestinian if you are talking about a prisoner, maybe some of them maybe even killed Israeli soldiers? So we try to stay away from that subject altogether. But Palestinian resistance is legitimate. Any people um, have the, 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 the right from a legal, political, and even moral point of view to resist military occupation uh, uh, under any circumstance. We have seen this all over the world, from Cuba to Vietnam to South Africa and so forth. But when it comes to Palestinians, we are very guarded. We are very guarded in the kind of language that we use. I feel like sometimes we are tested. Like you have to pass a certain quiz as a Palestinian to, to be accepted by whatever community that's quizzing you. I have been told in the past, not anymore, years ago, Ramsey, uh, we would like to invite you to speak at a conference. Okay, very good. But before, um, do you support one or two state solutions? Uh, that is the, the litmus test and or um, do you support violent resistance or non-violent resistance? And you kind of have to answer the right questions, check this box, you know, and make a good presentation of yourself, and then you are validated. And as a result, the prisoners were not discussed, were not talked about, because they are too dangerous to that narrative. So what, what I did in that book, I wanted to change the conversation. I wanted, the idea of really behind all of my books is trying to imagine an alternative history of Palestine. Uh, a history that doesn't go through the prism of Zionism or anti-Zionism either. Something independent from it because believe it or not, we Palestinians have existed before Israel decided that we should exist when they colonized Palestine. We have existed for thousands of years in that land. Palestine is mentioned in the Bible repeatedly. Uh, Palestine existed in the times of Romans. Did you guys know that in Gaza, uh, this place that is seen as um, 
um, as, as Israel you know, kind of would like to see as an irritant and a place where terrorists thrive and so forth. The, the, the oldest currency in Palestine is called the Gaza Shekel. It's, it's a thousands years uh, currency. And I, I, I was gifted uh, a, a Gaza Shekel by one of my readers and I take so much pride in that Shekel. We have existed thousands of years before Israel had existed. Um, so we, are, we, are, we should be in no situation that we have to justify and explain and beautify ourselves and therefore neglect the prisoners. So the question to the, that I raised with every prisoner, and I've spoken with many prisoners, their families there, um, and some of prisoners actually in prison, we communicated with them uh, using uh, smuggled cell phones that they had in their prison cells. Um, but the question wasn't, why did you do what you did, or anything of that nature. The question was, started with, tell us about a single moment that meant so much to you, that has defined your life. And the, it could be anything. It could be the last time you met your mother, the, the day you heard that your wife had a baby when you were in prison, the day that, that um, um, or it could be that your trial, your court, the day that you carried out uh, your resistance operation or not. Many of them were poets. Who were, uh, one of the ladies we spoke with was a prisoner uh, 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 who was in prison because she wrote a poem that was published on Facebook. And she uh, was in prison for months as a result of that. Um, but we try not to define them uh, against the backdrop of Israel, but of them as Palestinian heroes who have taken a moral stance that has cost them everything, and I mean everything. The torture that they have been through, the disabilities that they have created, many of them died in prison. Many of them had many loved ones died in prison. Um, one of the prisoners we spoke with uh, had a daughter who was six months old, and uh, when she, he left prison, she was uh, married with children. And he hasn't seen her once because the Israelis would not allow him to visit with his family during the, you know, the, the many years he was in prison. And, and, and the spirit of resistance can be easily detected in the kind of answers. The, none, none of the prisoners had any regrets to speak. Oh, I wish I knew what I know now. None of that. That spirit of resistance was incredible. And more beautiful than all of this is the spirit of unity that these Palestinians who belong to various factions actually had in prison. And in one particular instance, I actually brought some of the prisoners. Uh, in, we were in Istanbul and they managed to leave Gaza. And I brought Fatah and Hamas prisoners and we had them sit together and have a conversation. And in the beginning, it was a little bit awkward. But one of them mentioned the person who tortured him the name of the, uh, of the Israeli uh, um, a surgeon or officer who tortured him, and the Fatih guy, that's a Hamas guy, the Fatih guy says, I was tortured by the same guy. <laughs> and, and suddenly this whole factional nonsense and ideological divide disappeared. And they start sharing memories, and, and even though in the beginning they you know, kind of shook hands kind of in a formal way, at the end uh, they were hugging and, and, and crying. Um, so, really, that's kind of the idea. I feel like even though I write in English, ultimately my, my target audience is the Palestinian himself. I want the young generation to know that there are so many opportunities, that we are not as different as you may think, and there is a foundation of that unity that the people have created for themselves. You need to start building on that. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ramzi. I don't know if we have uh, questions. Tenemos preguntas aquí entre el entre el público, entre nuestros. Uh... Do you have any questions here among the audience, among the students uh, here with us today? Maybe you will get a higher higher grades, higher marks if you ask a good question. So maybe we have. Um, yeah, we do have some questions from our friends in YouTube. We are asking whether it would be possible for us to see in the near future the unity of the Palestinian resistance with the Palestinians in the diaspora. 
Right. I, I think I think that resist uh, that unity already exists there. It's uh, it, it's not the kind of unity that would can be solidified with uh, signatures, or you know negotiations in Cairo or Sanaa or Mecca or uh, Kuala Lumpur and Istanbul as happened between Hamas and Fatih repeatedly. They signed all sorts of papers, and at the end of the day, they did not keep to any of these commitments. Uh, it's it's the kind of of unity that that exists. Um, at an intellectual level, but also at a popular level. At a popular level. Uh, um, for example, my children uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Seattle, who, as, as I said, never been to Gaza, never been to Palestine, um, they know all of the Palestinian uh, social media activists, and they follow them, and they interact with them, and, 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 and that's the real resistance in Palestine. And by the way, when I say resistance, maybe I should have defined that term from the very beginning. I'm not talking about uh, men with guns, uh, although that is a legitimate form of resistance, and in Gaza we have seen that happening. But if you look at the Palestinian Authority, they have thousands of men with guns that transpire, you know, with the, result in nothing. So it's not that. I am talking about resistance as manifested in numerous facets of society, including popular resistance. I think, I think a Palestinian, I met a Palestinian woman in East Jerusalem once uh, uh, that was selling a produce uh, in, in Bab al Amud in Old Jerusalem. And I chatted with her for a while. And she told me that she hasn't been allowed to go back to Gaza where her family is from for the last 20 years. But she sells produce, she gets the produce from a village nearby in Jerusalem, uh, and she sells them in Jerusalem every single day. She th goes through all the checkpoints, and she has to fight with the soldiers, and she gets beaten up sometimes. The settlers attack her little stall and, and just dump her produce once in a while, and she keeps coming back every single time. And she collects money, and she sends that money to her children and grandchildren in Gaza because they are under siege. That is resistance. So, so when we say resistance, it's, it's these silent warriors that, that do not have the privilege of coming and talking to you here. And, and you will never see them on Al Jazeera or CNN, and they don't even have social media accounts. But these are the true people that is giving people like us, whether here outside Palestine or in Palestine, giving us the power and the confidence to speak of Palestinian resistance. And I think we are, begin we are seeing that unity. It's happening. And it's happening, uh, as I said, despite of the fact that many of us cannot even be home, and many of our comrades at home cannot leave, we are still finding that kind of common ground slowly as time passes. Yes, there's uh, a question. There's a question over there, at the back of the room. Uh, I understood from your presentation you are not very fond of Mahmoud Abbas, but I would like to know who do you foresee to be his successor? Would it be Majid Farah, Jibril Rajoub, Salam Fayyad, Ismail Haniya? And who would you like to be the new president of the Palestinian Authority? I mean, who do you think could be the successor, and who would you like to be? Thank you. Thank you um, for that. This is a political question in the sense that, I mean, if I am to answer it uh, in the spirit of this meeting, I would say it actually doesn't matter. Honestly, it doesn't. Um, and I think most likely there is all sorts of um, kind of uh, 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 backroom discussions about you know, who is the new strong Palestinian? By the, by the way, the, the, the strong man of Palestine is a term that has been used repeatedly by American politicians and diplomats because they always think, and this is something that applies to most of the Middle East and, and Africa, this idea, not the representative, the democratic representative of the Palestinian people or the Iraqi people or the Lebanese people, but rather the strong man. Who is the one that we can do business with? And I've been asked this actually many times in, 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 in the past in, in, in Washington by various you know, officials. And Ramsey, who is the Palestinian that we can do business with? Like, they want names. Give me names. 
you know, and, and, and what a silly question and what an, a patronizing question to begin with, uh, frankly. Uh, but um, I think there is an attempt at, you know, cooking some sort of a deal in which Mahmoud Abbas's representative is someone who can maintain the status quo. Now, on the other hand, there is a, a, a struggle within the Fatah movement itself. And I think that's an important struggle. And we have to pay attention to this struggle. Because the Fatah movement is not necessarily all corrupt officials and, and such. There are many people within Fatah that are still part of a revolutionary momentum that started by Fatah itself many years ago. But they have been relegated. They are not important. They are not significant. They are not the strong men of Palestine that Israel can do business with. And this is why they have been removed entirely. Um, um, many of them are in prison, the likes of Marwan Barghouti, for example. So, so I think more important than who is going to uh, become the new Palestinian president, again, a president of a country that is not really uh, a sovereign country on the ground and has no control over anything on the ground, is, is rather what will happen to Fatah itself. Will the revolutionary elements of Fatah be able to use that as a transition to go back to the way it was, or will it just disintegrate even further. And I think this is important, not because of the future of the Palestinian Authority, it's important um, as, as far as the Palestinian street is concerned, because whether we like it or not, Fatah and Hamas represent a very large number of Palestinians, and they are active in the streets, and they are part of the events that are transpiring before our eyes, and they do matter, and they do matter greatly. So I think that the, the result of this conflict within the Fatah movement is going to have repercussions on the Palestinian society itself. Ahí viene el micrófono, por favor, use la mascarilla. Yes, please uh, use the mask, face mask. I want, to, I want to ask you about the one state solution, because some people are saying that due to settlements in the West Bank, uh, many uh, Palestinians can change their mind and they can start to demand one, uh, one state solution uh, because uh, one state solution would be the end of Israeli state at a Russia's apartheid state no? in the Middle East. So do you think that uh, there is a possibility of Palestinian people demanding that? Thank you. Right, so we were, we've been talking a lot about transitions that are happening in Palestine and that's one of the transitions. And it's a very important transition, just, uh, I would say about a couple of weeks ago, a new uh, poll, public opinion poll, came out in Palestine that for the first time, the number of Palestinians, or the percentage of Palestinians who believe in one state solution is actually higher than the Palestinians who believe in a two-state solution. Um, let me qualify something. I'm not a big fan of the word solution itself, because the word solution indicate that, you know, that, that there is something puzzling and confusing and we don't really know how to resolve it, so we present various solutions. I think the, the natural solution to military occupation is ending military occupation. The solution to apartheid is dismantling apartheid. Uh, you don't have solutions to racism you can't, because you cannot negotiate with someone who believes that racism is a way of life. Uh, ending racism, ending apartheid, ending colonialism. Uh, and once you have that, then you have the basis for a true conversation about maybe the structural element of that political solution. Now, that said, I believe that the two-state solution was really never intended to be a solution in the first place. I think the Americans have played with the Palestinians a very uh, um, uh, kind of deceptive game of carrot and stick. You know, you have the good Palestinians, and these are the ones that have been, you know, bribed with money and the promise that eventually your political horizon is going to be a two-state solution. And the bad Palestinians that we don't talk to, we, you know, their lives doesn't matter, and Israel can do to them whatever it wants. And those two Palestinians cannot communicate because if the good Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, communicates with the bad Palestinians, they will not get any money from anybody. 
they will be cut off, right? So I think that the two-state solution was really, it is that carrot. And, and you know, the Palestinian people, I mean, they did believe that it is possible. They were told that it is possible. There was this illusion that maybe uh, we can start with this transition, we can have a state, some of the refugees can come back, and it's better than this, this situation, this perpetual conflict. Uh, they had a, a lot of trust in their uh, uh, leadership at the time. Yasser Arafat had a great deal of credibility among Palestinians. I was in Gaza when he came back, and I remember nobody was at home in Gaza when Yasser Arafat came back. Uh, everybody was in the streets, millions of people, even those who d did not even support Yasser Arafat were all in tears when they saw the man coming back. There was this really a great deal of, of, um, of trust in that leadership and as a result in a two-state solution. But of course, um, how many years has it been since uh, the Madrid talks? 30 years? And prior to that, decades of talking about that possibility? And at the end of the day, not only we don't have a state, our whatever remained of that potential geography of that future state is now little dots on a map. And, and all these disconnected dots are separated by military checkpoints. And you can't get there without getting a permission from the Israeli soldier at that particular checkpoint. So there is really no solution to talk about. The whole two-state solution conversation is still happening in, in among politicians and diplomats and it's like they are from Mars. It's, it's, it's like of no relevance, like what are they talking about? I mean, ha when was the last time they actually visited Gaza? Or even, you know, went through their cars through the maze that is the West Bank, going through walls and upon walls, it's uh, this, this Kafkian type reality. And they st still speak of a two-state solution as as 55 years of military occupations and so-called facts on the grounds having passed. But of course, Palestinians were always told, you have to be pragmatic, you have to be realistic, you cannot demand, you know, practically uh, one state solution means that it's the end of state of Israel uh, as a Jewish state. And, and Israel would never accept that, not with all the military power it has, not with all these powerful friends uh, it has and so forth. But I think with time we actually began realizing that we are living in that one state reality. Think about it. Palestinians and Israelis, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews are living between the Jordan River and the sea. But we are living according to completely different rules. Some of us gets, gets this much water and others have massive swimming pools. Some of us live behind walls and refugee camps. Some of some of and the, 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 the Israeli Jews are living in villas and living the good life. Some of us cannot even go to a hospital and others are constantly traveling as tourists all over the world. That reality exists, but it exists in a very unequal sort of way. So whether we want to call it a one-state solution or not, what we want to do is we need to dismantle this racist apartheid reality that controls the life of Palestinians and give them equal rights. Now, how do we term that coexistence using political language? It actually doesn't matter. And I think it will be ultimately the, the Israelis and the Palestinians once they reach and accept the fact that this status quo cannot be maintained. People cannot be living in that situation for eternity. Genocide cannot be a matter of an everyday reality. Once we accept that, once the Israelis accept that, and they can only accept that with Palestinian resistance in mind, once that happens, how do we formulate that politically? It really doesn't matter. Sí, otra pregunta aquí, quizás la última. Puedes hacerla en español si quieres. Um, now, the last question, and you can ask it in Spanish if you wish. Hello. Well, thank you very much for your speech. It's been uh, very interesting. And I'd like to ask Ramsey a question about uh, precisely what he's just been talking about. It's uh, a new uh, political subject matter, a new poli Palestinian political subject matter. Maybe it's time to raise the bar 
and try to contribute to create a new solidarity with Palestine that goes beyond this human rights discourse and this institutional discourse. It actually comes as a surprise that uh, a lecture such as the, yours and you know, mostly here at Casa, it happens here at Casa Arabe. Now, uh, this is also obviously linked together with the healthcare vet veto and the criminalizations of uh, criminalization of NGOs that are openly in favor of resistance. So do you really think that we need new political organizations or bodies that can um, help uh, move uh, ahead this Palestinian project? Uh, are you aware of this uh, conference that was held in Madrid, uh, Masar Baril, that uh, is looking for a reunification of the international solidarity versus Palestine, and what do you think about it? Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question, an excellent point as well. <clears throat> First, let me just tell you about a problem we've had in the solidarity movement. Um, and it's not a problem in the solidarity movement itself, but it's a problem with the circumstances uh, uh, through which the solidarity movement uh, came about. Um, for a long time, we Palestinians did not have uh, a Palestinian voice that can, that can utilize all these energies all over the world and, and use them uh, in, a, in a politically wise strategy for the interest of the Palestinian people. Um, we've, we've lost that since Oslo. It's not the lack of Palestinian leaders. We've never, this is, there is a misconception that we've had, that Palestinians never had good leaders or good leadership. Uh, and I know of good, very, very smart Palestinians who've said that, um, but it's not true. We actually do. It's just that Palestinian leadership is never allowed to operate as such. Maybe they operate in neighborhoods and refugee camps, but they cannot serve the role of the representative of the Palestinian people because they are too dangerous, because we don't like them, we don't want to talk to them, because you want a Palestinian who uses uh, an amiable language, a language that makes the Spanish diplomat and the British politicians and the American congressmen feel comfortable talking and sitting with them and taking pictures while smiling, right? Um, but as a result, there's this vacuum that was created. You have, because of the resistance of the Palestinian people, a solidarity movement that's growing all over the world but it's decentralized and is not really able to itself come up with a political program. And I know this is happening within the Palestinian movement itself. Uh, this is not a comment on Masar al-Badil itself. I think there are a lot of good activists who are very frustrated with the circumstance and they are trying to, and they know that there is a historical transition upon us right now and they want to utilize it and they have every right to do so. The problem is we do not want to create the kind of elitism that has existed in the past. Because don't forget that Mahmoud Abbas and Abu Ala Abu, uh, and Abu uh, and Saba Rikat and all these guys were at one point, they were revolutionary characters. Well, maybe uh, Mahmoud Abbas never was a revolutionary character. <laughs> so I, I take this back. But in essence, many of these characters were actually you know, they, they, they were the ones who started Fatah and the PLO, and they had incredible relationships with liberation movements in Africa and South America and so forth. But elitism, you know, where, which is the, the very idea that you start seeing yourself as part of a certain class, and you start defending the interests of that particular class at the expense of everybody else, is a real thing. And it happened. Now you have two Palestinian classes. The one presenters, these are the people that claim to represent us, and they do, don't tend the 99 percenters. But as a result, you have many Palestinians, whether in Istanbul, in Doha, in, in the US, in Spain, and, and in other places, who are saying, let's form an alternative leadership. Let's do that. And I worry about that. Because I, number one, I think the leadership has to emerge through the Palestinian people themselves. It cannot happen through any alternative medium anywhere in the world, no matter how sincere we are. But this is where I feel like there is an opportunity. The Palestine solidarity movement worldwide needs that leadership. And that's where I feel like the Palestinian activist belongs there more than any other place. We need to 
energize, mobilize, communicate with, we need to build not just a movement, we need that movement to overlap with other existing movements, from Black Lives Matter to the Native American struggle to the landless movements of South America to the various struggles for equality in Africa. And it is real, it is real, it, they exist and they are waiting for us. And it's, uh, you know, I was recently in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and I was told I was the first Palestinian to speak there since God knows how many years. And it was really disquieting and disturbing that this is the issue. That, you know, this is our strategic depth, Africa, South America. These are our people who have always had our back. When all of Europe always voted against us, it was Africa that always voted for us. Um, we need to be communicating with them. We need to be talking to them. We need to tap into the, the you know, reserve of solidarity. And we need to give them solidarity back. That's what intersectionality, that's what mutual solidarity is all about. So I'm not saying that if you're a Palestinian living outside of Palestine, you cannot be part of the struggle in Palestine itself. Of course you can. But everybody has to kind of use his position and his privilege and his advantage uh, to, to, in the best way possible. And I think our struggle internationally is indeed creating a solidarity movement that is in tune with the Palestinian struggle at home. So that when Palestinians in at home tell us, this is what we want, I want everybody all around the world to tap into that and push that agenda worldwide so that we don't have so many separate conversations about the same subject at the same time. Vale, vamos a coger esta última pregunta, si es pregunta. So let's take up this last question, if it is a question, because we usually end up by 7.30, but we will make the most of uh, Memphis' presence here today. Sabi orid wa awaddu an asul bil al-lugha al-arabiya. Sabi que es que no tenemos traducción para... Unfortunately, we don't have an interpretation uh, for people who are... Uh, online so if you'd like to ask the question in arabic and then you trans you interpret it yourself into either spanish or english because it's uh, the people who are, don't speak the language Recently, I've read in the newspapers that you, you're going to allow, I mean, they are going to allow the uh, Palestinians from Gaza to work in Israel. They are speaking about uh, somewhere around 70 to 100,000 people. So, what do you think? And what do you think about this? Thank you. Uh, before, before the first Intifada, um, most Palestinian workforce were working in Israel. As cheap laborers, um, many of them were very well educated. They, um, they were not given pensions, they were not given their rights, they were um, exploited all the time. The Intifada ended that as a form of collective punishment. The Israelis did not uh, allow the Palestinian workers to go into Israel and as a result that, that economic depression created by the Israeli decision kind of was one of the main reasons of why the Intifada subsided and eventually died out. There are other factors as well. Of course not. Just because Israel is going to allow a couple of hundred Palestinians to, uh, uh, to work in, in Israel, it, it's like, um, what is the best way of describing that? It, it's, it's, you are denying Palestinians their freedom, you are denying them their freedom of movement, their rights, their sovereignty, their, their identity and everything, but you are giving them this tiny, tiny little uh, supposed privilege or sign of goodwill and, and um, with the hope that Palestinians are going to suddenly fall in love with Israeli colonialism, with Israeli occupation. We are still prisoners, whether we are working in Israel as cheap laborers, you know, fighting for the privilege to be exploited by our Israeli masters or not, it doesn't change the situation in any possible way. So it's not um, a good step, it's not a bad step, it's completely irrelevant uh, to that. Um, Israel has its own reasons of why they are doing this, but it's by no means it's really intended 
to make life easier for Palestinians. Because if that is indeed the intention, then why aren't they allowing Palestinians to import even cement to build? You know, I had to, I had to, um, I needed to build my father's uh, grave, uh, grave in Gaza because it was made of, of dirt and, and mud and there was a flood and it, the grave almost disappeared. So I called my cousins and I said, I'll send you some money so you can buy cement and build a grave. They were looking in Gaza for days. They couldn't find a little bit of cement to build a graveyard or a grave for my, for my dad. Um, how is that? If you want a sign of goodwill, allow Palestinians to bring in cements. If you want a sign of goodwill, allow Palestinians to travel freely. If you want a sign of goodwill, allow cancer medicine. Cancer patients are dying in Gaza. People are dying of easily treatable diseases. 97% of Gaza water is polluted. It's not drinkable, but they drink it anyway because they have no other option. But why is that the case? Because Israel keeps bombing the, the, the uh, electric uh, uh, generators and, and deny Palestinians fuel so that they cannot uh, run the sewage systems, they cannot uh, provide electricity. Gaza receives anywhere between three to four hours of electricity every single day. Uh, what they did with the workers, it was meant to be um, a propaganda. Uh, so the media can places Israel uh, in, in a positive news cycle so that people would say, well, Israel is doing its part, so will the Palestinians reciprocate? And it's a very good game that the Israelis have been playing for many years, but of course it's not going to lead to anything good. Muy bien, pues muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Ramzi. So, just very briefly, tell us who is the strongest man who can deal with Pals. No, I'm joking. Um, muchísimas gracias a, a todas. Monal Kord. Huh? Monal Kord. Is the strongest. Monal Kord is our person. Yes, Monal Kord. He, he is our uh, strong person in Palestine. Don't forget. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ramsey Barut for being here today with us, for speaking to us not only about this issue that's uh, passionate to us and should be uh, also a major concern to everyone and thank you all thank you all for being here thanks for all the people watching uh, us uh, uh, via youtube thanks to everyone who's asked questions and uh, also thanks to for speaking about the silent warriors that you've mentioned these beautiful stories of resistance so people who you not necessarily think of, uh, you know, re of resistance, of, because there's not only military resistance, there's very many ways of, uh, of being in the resistance and uh, to, be, uh, to be in solidarity. And thank you, thank you, uh, um, Rami, thank you, thank you, Ramsey, thank you, Ichaso, for being here with us. Please follow all different activities. Uh, let me remind you that we will have a solidarity concert um, organized by Umbra in Matadero, Madrid. This is also part of the uh, Week of Palestine, the Palestinian Week, um, after the Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian People. So thank you very much and see you soon. <laughs>